I'm going to call to order the March 23rd special meeting of the West Sacramento City Council and the Redevelopment Agency and Financing Authority. We're going to begin tonight as we do each week with the Pledge of Allegiance. I'd like to invite our guests to join the council and staff in the pledge, which tonight will be led by one of the seven West Sacramento nominees for the Business Journal's 40 Under 40 uh, list, Mr. Aaron Laurel. Uh, the council did meet in close session. We have note to uh, consider, uh, to confer with our real property negotiator regarding the properties noted on our close session agenda. No, act, no uh, reportable action was taken. That uh, brings us to presentations by the public on matters not on the agenda, but within the jurisdiction of the city council. Uh, this is an opportunity for a public forum on items that are not on our agenda. We do ask that anyone wishing to address the council on this or any other item this evening to please fill out one of the yellow cards that's available at the front door and turn it into the city clerk. In front of the city clerk is a timer that we use to make sure that everyone has a chance to be heard. And to that end, we ask that all the comments be limited to no more than three minutes. Uh, there's also a flip chart uh, in front of the city clerk, which uh, indicates which agenda item we're on. And since we only have two, it shouldn't be too, too confusing this evening. We, do ask, we know for some folks speaking in public can cause some anxiety and uh, nervousness. And so we do ask that there not be any boos or catcalls or applause or demonstrations or f fruit and vegetables being thrown and we maintain a civil discourse in the chambers. So with that, we do have a couple of requests to speak under, uh, as, uh, under, on items not on our agenda tonight. And the first is by uh, Patrick uh, Cornell. Patrick Cornell, and my question is, is if we, California had an earthquake and a tsunami that hit, and some of our levees broke here in West Sacramento, Will we be able to equip um, the displaced people of West Sacramento and accommodate them with living quarters? So what, the way the pro this process works is we take whatever comments and questions there are, at the, and at the end, we'll return to our uh, city manager and the council for any, any responses or respond clarification. It's not a back and forth at it's this point. Back yeah. and forth. Okay, and the reason why I ask this is, uh, actually, uh, the reason why I'm dressed well, I've been out in the street, all night last night and today, um, trying to assist our homeless of West Sacramento to replace them or uh, reassist them or assist them to um, relocate as they keep being pushed from one uh, area to another area to another area. My real question is: is what can we do for uh, the homeless of West Sacramento? Um, how can we truly help them? And, um, we're willing to. Uh, uh, West Sac, any way that we can possibly do. We help over here on Sacramento side, and we'd love to help here. Um, we are uh, in the process of getting a facility of, of 75 room uh, building with the house in front of it, and that will be moving most of our people out of Sacramento that are homeless on the, uh, the levee and the boat ramp and different places like that. We're looking for a solution right now because it, this, is, this is an emergency for them. Um, let it out of their, their homes, which is on the banks of, of the levees, and they're being rousted by the police officers to move. And it's in a situation like it is, and it has been the flooding and, and, and everything like it is. I mean, what did they do? One bad situation after another. Thank you. We'll get to that in just a moment. Um, Bill Lowell? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. William Lowell of West Sacramento, for the record. Uh, the state budget problem, I did have one main new thought, and that is uh, I know this. Uh, redevelopment monies has uh, been the big ticker and I was thinking maybe th maybe that should be split three ways like one-third to the state one-third to the owner and one-third to the city or county I'm speaking of the profits that are made uh, once the land is rezoned 
and and of course we should uh, uh, the franchise tax board should audit all tax returns and the offshore corporation uh, that law should be changed so that if you do business in this state or in the, in the other states uh, you should pay taxes and, and then there's I can just think of all kinds of ways we can cut prison costs, and, uh, including that 25 years to life thing. And I think I think we should consider uh, the state returning to a part-time legislature because it seemed like things were done on time way back when. It just seems like this whole time just, just wasted more time and causing more problems. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lowell. Those are the two requests we have under that. Ms. Richardson on the homeless question, and it went my, it was Mr. Johansson, who's our representative on the on the um, uh, homeless task force, wants to welcome the way in as well. Ms. Richardson, do you have a comment? Uh, Mr. Mayor, our, our emergency operations plan does have a, a shelter component to it. And in the event that there is major flooding, um, we do have provisions for sheltering primarily at the schools and, and other agencies. Uh, right now there is, um, we, we are having some issues um, with, with the homeless in, on the river's edge because it, it is getting flooded. And we're trying to work with um, some of our social service agencies on trying to address that. Yeah, I think the um, <clears throat> there is a 10-year homeless plan uh, for Yolo County, as there is in Sacramento County. And I know through that commission, um, we're going through and looking at um, the actual services being provided and also the housing element uh, that's going to be coming up fairly quick. But the problem in West Sacramento is you probably know that the Broderick Christian Center burned down, and that's really what caused a lot of the services now to be provided at the boat ramp. Well, now we've got a flood, or at least flooding at that level, so we don't there's, I mean, this is pretty much an emergency situation now, but um, it is on our agenda to do something about homeless to help take care of those folks. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a process that's ongoing right now. But there is a plan that's being put in place, and there, are, uh, there is momentum to do that, both in the countywide and the citywide. Thank you. Mr. Hanson. All right, that brings us then to our, our regular agenda, which is item one, consideration of resolution 11-19. Authorizing, authorizing the executive director or is a designee to take various actions to effectuate an affordable housing development at the Delta Lane property. Mr. Laurel. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, you have a, a brief PowerPoint uh, presentation to some visual context of this project. Uh, Delta Lane is a project we've been working on since uh, 2008. Um, its origins um, come from the Prop 1C grant uh, obligations that we have uh, that for the grant that we received in early 2008. Uh, we designated this site for the development of 175 units in that application and are contractually obligated to the state to uh, provide those housing units, 130 of which uh, are to be included in an affordable project. Uh, before I get to the specific details of the project, I want to give you a little background context of how we got here uh, to this project, because there's a lot of uh, steps that we took along the way that aren't specific to the Delta Lane development, but made it possible. So the Tower Bridge Gateway Modification Project West Phase was done in 2007, and this was the, the project that essentially turned the old freeway into a, a city street and also created the uh, excess right-of-way that was uh, made possible to or made Delta Lane a possible development site. It really used to be a freeway off-ramp um, in the flyover, and when, when that was demolished, it created the right-of-way that was uh, necessary to assemble the property. The Ironworks development created the western edge of the property um, and some of the street frontage there. So once the bridge district is fully built out, you'll have a street um, bisecting the two. Tower Court across the street is a property that the redevelopment AC owns. It's currently being cleaned up, um, and that was a property we assembled back in the 90s. The Experience Motel, uh, I know the council is very familiar with it, was fairly recent. Um, we bought the motel and demolished it in 2008 um, and also did a brownfield cleanup 
and that creates uh, the, the transition area from the downtown to Delta Lane, uh, the city and redevelopment you see own the entire property there. In 2009, directly to the east of the site, we removed a railroad track and uh, the grain silo that used to be there, or grain facility used to be there, uh, was demolished. And that creates the, the eastern boundary of the site across the railroad tracks and also provided the possibility to punch through Fifth Street as part of the Bridge District project and do the Tower Bridge Gateway East project. The West Capitol Avenue Streetscape project that was just recently finished um, really provided the connection between the downtown and all the amenities that would serve the Delta Lane project, such as the community center, the college, the library, and, and, and the, the grocery stores and uh, other, other uh, amenities we have in this area. Um, the streetscape provided the new sidewalks to connect to Delta Lane. And of course, the Tower Bridge Gateway East Phase project, which is now under construction, uh, provides the access to the river, to downtown, and, and uh, all the amenities go along with that and creates the, the eastern edge of the Delta Lane property. So this is how the project site looks now uh, in, in 2010. There's been some changes since then, of course, because you have the bridge district now under construction. Um, and just to show you the, the context of where the Delta Lane site will be once that project is complete, um, this graphic shows the bridge district street grid and its ultimate build out uh, with the Delta Lane site highlighted there. And the first phase of that infrastructure, this really just shows the, the roadways that are being constructed. Um, you can see how Delta Lane fits into the overall scheme of the, of the bridge district. And in terms of the actual project uh, being proposed, it's 175 units, as I mentioned, that we committed to back in 2008. Um, 129 is the specific number of affordable units that we committed to. Um, we were awarded the Prop 1C grant and since then um, entered into contracts, a disbursement agreement, and we recorded a, an affordable housing covenant against the site to ensure that it could not be developed for anything other than the 175 units that were committed. Um, and in your staff report, there's a long list of other actions that the, the agency and city have taken since uh, early 2008 to specifically prepare this site for housing development. Um, those included, in addition to the covenants that we reported, the, the phase two environmental site assessment was done um, using actually uh, state dollars um, from VTSE for that. Um, and the purpose of that was to uh, verify that there weren't any contamination issues so that we can move forward with the, with the housing project there. And then between May and July of 2010, uh, we assembled the remaining right-of-way. There were some, uh, in addition to the old Highway 275 right-of-way, there were some additional uh, smaller pieces of right away that need to be assembled to bring the site to its ultimate configuration. Last year, we spent a great deal of time uh, working through financial assumptions and development programming for this site to get to a, you know, a real uh, ground level project. And so we're at that stage now where we have an estimated financing gap. Uh, and that's the basis for the $11.7 million uh, loan commitment that we're uh, asking the council to authorize uh, tonight. And um, we, uh, we foresee the site being developed in two phases, the first being 130 units of senior housing uh, that will be affordable, and another 45-unit project, um, at least 45 units, will be the second phase on a piece of the property that we're reserving for later. Um, and also in 2011, this was the early part of this year, we entered into discussions with the West Sacramento Housing Development Corporation. Um, the idea behind that discussion was that the HDC could, as a nonprofit, the, uh, an ownership, um, uh, a portion of the ownership of the project, uh, because it will be a tax credit project, so there's, a, there's always a nonprofit component that represents about 1% of the interest. Uh, so the, the HDC um, brings a couple of benefits. Number one, it provides an opportunity to build organizational capacity for the HDC to work with us and work with the developer to build the project. And then number two, they have access to funding that we n don't necessarily have, and, and that could be a big help there. And what you see here is just a schematic layout of how we see the project being developed in the two phases. On the right, you have the Delta Lane uh, Senior Project. It's uh, roughly a two-acre site. Um, it has the street frontage uh, that, that is along Tower Bridge Gateway. And then to the left would be the uh, roughly about an acre in total property for uh, the mixed-use project that would be the second phase. There is a pump house that needs to stay on that property, um, but we have through this schematic layout, um, come up with a way to do both. We can have the site access for the pump house, but also the, the, the two developments. And just a couple of features that we are looking into for the Delta Lane project. Obviously, it will be a transit-oriented project. 
Um, in addition to being along the line of the streetcar, uh, there's actually a streetcar stop planned right in front of the site. We also already have a bus turnout that you can see in this photo that has been uh, pre-constructed. There isn't actually a bus stop there yet, but um, in the future, uh, when the housing is there, uh, we plan to have one there. And then uh, it is 65 units an acre is, is the density that's planned, and this just gives you an idea of what that might look like. It's, it's very similar density, actually, to the bridge housing project that we're doing further down in the bridge district. From here, uh, we are again authorized, or asking the council to authorize a loan agreement uh, between the city and the HDC for up to $11.7 million of future housing set-aside funds um, that would be generated both from the bridge district and elsewhere in the project area. The, uh, the next step after the loan agreement is, is executed would be to select a development team, and that includes an experienced developer of high-density housing that would work with the city and the HDC on actually carrying out the development. In that process, we'll do a di disposition and development agreement, which would convey the property to the development team um, and lay out the terms of the development. The actual loan agreement that we're asking the council to authorize will have conditions to disbursement that are um, fairly detailed, actually. They, they uh, lay out a, almost a set of milestones that the HDC and the developer and the city will have to accomplish before the city is obligated to disperse any of the loan funds. And that's uh, attachment two, I believe, in your staff report. The uh, feasibility of this project really depends on the availability of the housing funds. And so we've projected uh, the future housing set aside and the ability of the agency to issue bonds against that future housing set aside to provide the loan for this project. And with that, I'll turn it to the council for any questions you have about the project or the resolution. Questions from Mr. Laurel? This includes the mixed-use mixed use parcel as well? The uh, specific loan agreement only includes the affordable site. However, there is a possibility that as we go forward with the process of selecting a developer, there may be an opportunity to either do a uh, one developer for both projects or a larger project than 130 units that would satisfy the Prop 1C obligation. So we've, we've sort of left that open, but the actual loan commitment is only for the affordable community. agency owns the property? Right. The agency owns the property. And is, are there any covenants against the property that have been placed yes, by the agency? The, to the and the number one would be the covenant that we recorded on behalf of the state uh, to recognize the obligation to build 175 units. Um, and it's, it's a land use and affordability covenant. So essentially, anyone who's looking at that property would recognize it as an obligation to build 175 units, including the affordable units. Um, other covenants, I'm trying to remember. Um, I know we recorded. Uh, no new cov no no covenants in say the last two weeks. No. <laughs> and no, actually we did. We recorded we recorded a covenant recognizing that there was a, a small brownfield issue at the site. Um, that w during the phase two, we did discover a small uh, area that was impacted by the former operation of Caltrans at the property. Um, it, it is the type of contamination, though, that would be um, incidental to grading the site, but we did report a covenant acknowledging that uh, that issue. And I, I do believe there were others, and I'm sorry, I just can't recall off the top of my head what those were. So the, the mixed-use site, and the mixed-use site would, is unaffected by this directly? The loan agreement is only for the 130-unit affordable site. Mm -hmm. Going forward, though, as we get into negotiations with the uh, developer, and we will bring that back to you for the, for the selection of the developer and the DDA, um, we may propose to involve the entire property and include the mixed use site. Uh, but right now, we're just focusing on the loan commitment for the 130 units for affordable housing. And if the agency didn't exist in two months, what would, what would the implications be for, for the, these various I would say, number one, the implications are, uh, because we have the covenant recorded, we would point to that and, and point it out as an existing obligation that we have in the state of California and um, attempt to make the project uh, carry it forward as a as an obligated project. And, and in doing so, 
have the ability to collect the tax increment for the for the loan agreement to honor the loan commitment that we were proposing, um, and also to be able to um, sell the property or deed the property to the developer to do the mixed use portion because we are obligated to that as well to the state. That we're oh that mixed use portion is not part of our state obligation. That's correct. Oh okay. All right. Questions? Question? I don't have any requests to speak on this item. It's not a public hearing. Is my fancy way of saying is there a motion? <laughs> Mr. Viegas. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. How soon do you expect to go out? I didn't see it in the staff report, Aaron. How, how soon are you looking to uh, shop the property? Well, actually, we have been um, informally marketing the property to affordable housing developers for really three years since since uh, we got the grant. Uh, we actually got a lot of calls about it, as you can imagine. Um, but but formally, what we plan to do is once we have um, the direction of the council on this item, uh, we will start working immediately with the HDC to finish the loan agreement. Uh, from there, we will uh, start. We actually started the RFQ, um, and it's it's substantially done, but, but the direction we take tonight could impact a little bit of what we do. Uh, but I would say over the next six months, we look to get that RFQ completely done and have it on the street to actually uh, bring back a proposed developer um, within the calendar year, uh, definitely. Uh, we do have the obligation in the state, uh, the, the, H, the HCD uh, Prop 1C grant, to uh, pull building permits on this project uh, by June of 2013. So we do need to move quite aggressively to get there. So with that time frame, though, I mean, do you feel like, given what you've done so far, are we in a good position to um, select a, a prospective builder for the project, or are we trying to pull? Are we more pulling teeth with these kinds of projects right now? I mean, it seems to me that affordable housing is probably one of the only housing. Right. And right. this is what a three to four story. Yeah, it's yeah. a it's a high density project. There's yeah. there's a, a good number of developers in California and actually in our in our region that specialize in this kind of development. And we have received a great deal of interest across the state for this property. So I don't I don't foresee it being a problem getting the developer interested. The main issue is, of course, going to be the availability of, of our gap financing to support the project. Okay. Thank you. And is the, I mean, this is obviously a really critical location. Um, and both, uh, bo both in the long term, but also in the near term, if this project goes to construction in that time frame, it will be one of the early gateway development for the bridge district as well as showcasing the linkage between the downtown and the bridge district and tar bridge gateway and everything else so is is the loan amount here sufficient to deliver a very high quality project that you know that does not say affordable housing on it when you drive by or right. walk by right it, it's it's tough to project but what i can say is the, the way we sized the loan was based on a pro forma that was similar in cost to the bridge housing to the bridge property. So this, will, this, will, this is scaled to be more like bridge housing and less like uh, an existing project. Right. Okay. It, it's definitely it's definitely meant to be a high density project, which in and of itself suggests uh, different design qualities. But I would say, for comparison's sake, uh, the recently completed uh, Parkside to Sycamore development and the one that we're working on with bridge, this is somewhere in between that in terms of the, the subsidy per unit. But it's also a much larger project, so it doesn't take into account some of the economies of scale involved there. But we've attempted to size the loan um, to, you know, account for the fact that we want it to be a, a well-designed project. Okay. Yeah, I guess. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would move that we adopt Resolution 11-19, authorizing Executive Director or his or her designee to take various actions to effectuate an affordable housing development uh, at the Delta Lane property, including the completion of an, an execution of a loan agreement with the West Sacramento Housing Development Corporation, subject to the conditions of loan disbursement provided as attachment two. And find that the environmental impacts of the proposed project were fully analyzed in the Triangle Specific Plan Supplemental Environmental Impact Report, certified by the Council on October 7th, 2009. All second. All right, so I moved and seconded. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none. That motion carries. Thank you. And good luck. Item <laughs> <laughs> two is public hearing and approval of joint resolution 11-18 authorizing the execution of an option agreement with Stonelock District Holdings LLC for the purchase of the Stonelock District property. Who's got the, is this Mr. Bermudez? Good evening, Mayor, Council members. For you tonight is uh, authorizing an approval of an execution of an option agreement 
<coughs> with Stonelock District Holdings to purchase the Stonelock District property, which you see in the exhibit before you. I think before I begin, I'd like to point out there has been some revisions to the option agreement. This project or the option and a summary report per state law was noticed for two consecutive weeks. And there are updates to the option agreement that can be found on the agenda table to my right. And so the most current form of the option is available there, seeing that there are uh, individuals in attendance tonight in the community. Uh, <clears throat> what you see before you is an option agreement for what the agency considers its crown jewel of property. Uh, through a series of acquisitions, the agency assumed ownership of this property several years ago. And in 2006, recognizing the development potential of this site, <clears throat> sought out to find a developer that was suitable with, uh, to develop the property in a quality type mixed use concept. <clears throat> so in 2006, they solicited uh, proposals and in 2007, the Cordish company was awarded the preferred developer of this site. And in 2007, after the selection of Cordish, staff uh, approved with council recommendation, exclusive negotiating agreement to work out what would be a disposition development agreement with Cordish for the future development of the site. So over the several years that have passed since this approval, staff has been working with Cordish <coughs> to come to terms on an agreement. Through the course of those um, negotiations, uh, what has occurred is that instead of a disposition development agreement, DDA, uh, staff has now <coughs> uh, moved forward with an option agreement with Cordish. So before you deny it is approval of an option agreement with Stonelock Holdings LLC. And just real quickly, some key terms of this agreement is the purchase price. And at this time, that will be determined by an appraisal at fair market value in the next 180 days. In addition, the property does entail the full 215 acres, as you see in the exhibit. The term of this particular option agreement would be seven years, subject to extensions as described in the <coughs> option agreement. In addition, the, the exercise of the option includes, includes an agreement that states that the property will be divided into five parcels likely to be subdivided on the physical or geographic nature of the site. And then lastly would be option payments. Currently there'll be initial $500 option payment and there will be subsequent additional option payments of the amount of $75,000 paid to the agency. <coughs> With this, this concludes staff's presentation. Uh, Port Tellus representing the Cordish company is in attendance and my understanding would like to uh, address the council or as well staff can answer questions at this time. Our program, Mr. Tellis, are there questions for staff at this time? Okay. Mr. Tellis? I want to thank you for the opportunity. It's certainly been a long road that we've been on together. Uh, I, you know, uh, we've worked very hard on this, this project, and I know staff has, and I want to thank everybody for that. Uh, you know, uh, made some great friendships over the, uh, the history we've been working together. A um, lot, uh, lot of good times and, and I'd like to, uh, hopefully they'll continue. Um, you know, I think one thing that, you know, when I think about this project and what we've been through, and the, the word that comes to mind is resolve. And uh, I think that's a, a great compliment to this city. Uh, you know, it doesn't give up easily. It's no longer the little engine that could, it's the, it's the big engine that does now, or the, becoming the big engine that does. And uh, so many wonderful things have happened here uh, in the last uh, 10, 15, 20 years. It's, it's uh, uh, terrific to have seen. Um, you know, we are entirely committed to building a world-class project in West Sacramento. Uh, we've never started a project that we didn't finish. Every project that we've done, that we've completed. Uh, we've, you know, just to kind of reiterate some of the reasons that, that you all, uh, when, when you chose us, you know, we've, we've been fortunate enough to have won an additional ULI award. So now we have a total of seven ULI awards of excellent, excellence, which has 
uh, you know, sort of like uh, winning an Academy Award, and it's more than any other development company in the world. Um, so with that, I just I want to say thank you, and uh, I'm here to answer any questions that you might have. And, uh, there aren't any questions, uh, it's, which is not unusual. So I don't want to I don't want anybody to do, you know, property matters of property uh, acquisition and disposition are a matter for closed session, which and we had one prior to this meeting. So it isn't it isn't that there's not interest by the council, but we generally do not. Um, in the interest of the taxpayers, engage in the council level public session, public session uh, negotiations for the same reason n anyone anyone else in their right mind would not do. So that's what the, 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 the council's been fully briefed, which is okay. why there's not questions right. at this stage. But All right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, board. All right, we do have a couple of, of requests from the public to speak on this item as well. The first is by Bill Natty from the River City Rowing Club. Uh, Gary Gray will be next. Council and members, um, I'm here representing the Rowing Club tonight in support of the work. We're very pleased with the consideration and the involvement that we received from Portage and the city. And was taken by the state. Very great. We'll be followed by Mr. Lowell. Here, the, uh, there's folks watching us on TV, and they, or, and both of them would would uh, hear better if uh, you lower. There's a button to your right. Charlene's going to help to bring the podium so that it's directly in front of you. Thanks. Yeah, I want to know what's going to happen to the lot. Large you know, Well, I'll read that's in front of the court. Right? So as I indicated earlier, the way we handle questions that come from the podium is that we get all the public testimony and questions and comments, and then at the end of that period, we turn back to our staff and the council for responses. Okay, I'll wait okay. for the response. Okay, thanks. All right, and then Bill Lowell. Thank you again, Mr. Mayor, Willie Moore, West Sacramento. Uh, that's, this is a, I know this is a big money project and we're talking about redevelopment and uh, versus uh, the governor's plan versus local plans and so forth so uh, I still think we should uh, we can't if we can't divvy up the profits and help solve the state budget, then we should resort to those, uh, those suggestions that I made earlier. But uh, I find it strange that so many of the <coughs> so many of these businesses have LLC after after their names, uh, which I'm sure means limited liability corporation. And, and yet there's yet so many corporations still going bankrupt and, and, the, and the owners retaining maybe a half a billion dollars for themselves. And uh, who, who picks up the tab? The taxpayer. And so I'm a, I'm a little skeptical of the arrangement here, but just thought I'd mention that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Lowell. 
Uh, we generally have a policy that we don't take the cards after the public testimony has begun, and, but I, I understand the city clerk uh, may have had a misunderstanding about that. It does apply to public hearings as well, but we've got two cards, and we'll take them this time, but I don't want to create the impression that we're creating any exceptions, uh, just want, in case there was any mis mis misunderstanding, miscommunication in the communication with the city clerk. So Andy Wallace will be followed by Lon uh, Dieterman. Mayor, members of the City Council. My name is Andy Wallace, owner of Wallace Cool and Associates, a local geotechnical engineering and environmental consulting firm that is called the great city of West Sacramento, our home for 27 years now. Tonight I am here to speak on behalf of one of our clients, Port Tellus and the Cordish Company, in support of the Stone Lock District project. The Cordish Company's origins date back to 1910 and encompass four generations of privately held family ownership. During the past 10 decades, the company has grown into a global conglomerate of successful companies and one of the leading real estate development companies in the world. Over the generations, the company has remained true to the family's core values of quality, entrepreneurial spirit, long-term personal relationships, and integrity. As a testimony to the long-term vision of its family leadership, the company still owns and manages virtually every business it has created. The Cordish Company is one of the largest and most respected developers in the world with extensive expertise in almost every discipline of real estate, including entertainment and mixed use, lodging, sports, anchor developments, retail, office, and residential. Widely recognized as the leading international developer of large-scale urban revitalization projects and entertainment districts, the company has been awarded more Urban Land Institute awards for excellence than any other developer in the world. Many of the company's developments involve public-private partnerships and are of unique significance to the cities in which they are located. The Stone Lock project, uh, project will be one of those projects. The Cordish Company enters its 11th decade, well-capitalized and highly energized to continue its growth. Wallace Cool & Associates, as well as many other local companies and employees of those companies who live, work, and play in West Sacramento look forward to working with the Cordish Company on the Stone Lock District project and once again, improving this great city that we all care so much about. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wallace. And uh, Lon, is it Peterman? Or am I, am I mix, mixing it up both times? Lon Detterman with Miyamoto Detterman. International. I'm a principal with the firm. Um, you, many of you, I'm sure, have heard of Miyamoto International, um, all, the, all the work we do around, around the world. But um, our headquarters is here in Sacramento, in West Sacramento. Um, and uh, uh, we have anywhere from 25 to 45 people, depending on the economy, uh, here in West Sacramento, and many of them, as uh, Andy suggested, li live, work, and play here in, Sacra in the West Sacramento. And so I'm here basically just to express our support for the, the project, a um, uh, number of reasons. Um, you know, I personally worked with uh, Mr. Tellis on development projects, including uh, ones here in West Sacramento. And, uh, you know, he's a man of integrity, and uh, I'm, I'm sure he takes that wherever he goes, including Cordish companies. Um, and uh, uh, Cordish's reputation is, uh, it's uh, really, uh, they have a reputation of being a quality developer. Uh, this, this has been said already by some of the other speakers, but uh, I just would like to impress uh, upon you our, our uh, feeling about uh, their portfolio is very impressive, which basically speaks to the, the matter that they can do it. You know, they, they can make things happen. Um, they manage their business with integrity, including working with all of the design professionals and, uh, and uh, development partners. And their commitment to local businesses, such as ours, um, uh, in executing these developments, that's important not only for us, but also for the city, you know, investing in the city's resources to execute these developments in the city. Um, and third, I, I just think that the, the potential for this development is is phenomenal, and uh, we you know, we're looking forward to being a part of it. And uh, that's why we're here to express our support. Thank you very much. Right, thank you. All right, those are all the requests we have. So we'll, uh, I, I uh, you didn't notice, but I opened the public hearing earlier, and I'm going to close it now and turn it to uh, Mr. Bermudez, Mr. Robinson, for responses to the public comments. Yes, the comment regarding the lock, what will happen to lock facility, the lock will remain under ownership of the agency. Uh, it will be carved out of the 
planned parcelization of this of the project uh, if it moves forward and maintenance and all responsibilities would still remain with the redevelopment agency. All right. Anyway, are there further questions for staff at this time? I do. Yeah. Mr. Christoph. Or Mayor Pro Tem Christoph. Um, Jim, if I read the uh, proposal, the latest proposal, if I read it correctly, Cordish wants to have the option, if they start to develop a piece, to possibly farm that out to somebody else? Yes, there's language in the agreement that basically assigns uh, ownership to an affiliate and also non-affiliates. That seems to be um, not something they normally do because they usually start a project they finish a project i mean cordish is it's a world-class company it's a very very uh, good company from what i remember going through the process of choosing them um, but this seems like that's a little bit out of character well initially when cordish was selected and the ena executed it was with the cordish company and obviously through the discussions and negotiations terms come up and this is a term that came up you know in the negotiations on the option agreement that I think initially we didn't get really down into the details to, to kind of explore who ownership would be I guess in staff's perspective it, it was always assumed it'd be the Cordish company and there would be no discussion of affiliates and assignment to other parties okay thank you those are, so just to frame I mean we have because there, you know, there, I think there was a business journal article about this today, and I've certainly gotten a, um, more than a small number of communications about this item tonight. I mean, this this project has been going on for a long time. The city, and the redevelopment agency, and the port district all together, um, for many spent many years, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, and some cash, to make this property. Right? The, a little bit of this used to be owned by the, the uh, uh, a lot of it used to be owned by the Corps, Army Corps of Engineers as a place to dump their dredge spoils. Some of it was part of the rights of way for the operation of the locks, uh, which will not be, uh, just want, in case anybody's listening, the locks are not gonna re, they're not gonna be reoperated no matter who owns the property. I mean, the locks have, have been fully decommissioned. Um, so a little bit of it was that. We had some, I mean, there's a little bit of this everywhere. Um, and so we did a lot of work and a lot of lobbying in Congress and directly with the White House around assembling this piece of property. Because it, ha it is already a significant community asset, although unauthorized <laughs> for all-terrain vehicles and bikes and other things, um, but it has tremendous potential to be a, a community asset. It also has tremendous potential to be a, a community problem if it's, if it's developed improperly. Um, and it, is, it sits at a location with, with a lot of waterfront uh, property right on the north edge of Southport and on the south edge of, of Old West Sacramento. That's really a critical, one of the most critical locations for the community and for its potential, for good or for bad. And so it was a very high priority for us to assemble the, the, the parcels together, which we, we were finally able um, to do. We then uh, said, look, this, this is such a big deal, 215 acres of waterfront, uh, water-oriented property, that we want to make sure we, we have um, a really high quality development that matches what our aspirations are in the community for what this could be. And so we went out and did a very public um, uh, com competition for developers locally and nationally. It was like one of the first first times that West Sacramento said, yeah, we're, 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 we're of a national character now, so we're, we're gonna invite everybody across the country to, to compete to, uh, to develop this property in, in tune with what we're envisioning as part of the Southport Framework Plan and our general plan and the Southport envisioning process that we've gone through over the last uh, couple of years through all that community outreach and workshops and mapping and the Planning Commission and our own work. Um, it, through that process, Cordish was the, was the clear um, uh, selection from that. The, the experience uh, and the background, the record, um, and the commitment and the passion and the vision for for this property that, that Cordish had demonstrated uh, was in, exactly in line with what Cordish said tonight in terms of what the, what the potential was and what could be accomplished. And, and I think most, if not all, the members of the council have been to several Cordish projects to sort of see on the ground, what, is this, what does this really look like? And, and uh, uh, why are they distinctive and what, why, how would it fit? So we selected Cordish. 
uh, and that was a that was uh, uh, three and a half years ago through that process. And then since that time, we've been working with them, and they've been coming up with um, you know proposed land use maps that you know shows exactly the kinds of project that they would be developing and. We've been saying, okay, that, no, that's not quite right, or it should be a little more of that, a little less of that. No, we don't want as much tract housing. No, we want more entertainment. Yes, a little more of that. And that's exactly what our job is as a, as a community, is to figure out what the right project is um, to make sure that this isn't a project. It's not a project about maximizing tax receipts um, or, or anything like that. This is about making um, the highest and best use for, to improve the quality of life. and recreational and retail and entertainment amenities and the housing options and everything else for the residents of our community. Um, so that's been our plan and we've been working diligently um, with the Cordage Company over the last several years to make that happen, to make that project happen with a lot of roadblocks being thrown in front of us by the flood issues and FEMA and other things, which is why it hasn't completed yet. Although, you know, that's a good thing given the way the housing market is at the moment. So that's where we have been and it's been a deliberative transparent, open public process around what this property should be and what its potential is. Enter uh, the governor's proposal on redevelopment. Because I mean, we need to be very clear about why we're here tonight. The, gov the governor's proposed eliminating the redevelopment agency and demanding the more or less immediate liquidation of all of the redevelopment agency's assets, which includes, in our community, over 300 acres of property, over 36 properties, including this one. This is the largest of the redevelopment agency's um, properties and uh, would be required to be uh, liquidated, sold, um, uh, under the supervision of an agency that West Sacramento would not control, that potentially could have uh, you know, five, or five of, out of seven members that don't even live in West Sacramento making that decision about uh, where the, what should be, who, should, who should own this piece of property. And so it's put us in a position of having to deal with the potential threat of it being bought by someone who does not have the best interest of the community in mind, uh, and our and and we and since we won't be selling it to them in a year from now, we'd be, it would be this other agency. We have no guarantees that we could control how it would unfold, and so that's that's why we're here is to make sure that we avoid that that potential danger of and and Mr. Natty sort of referenced that if, you know if it just disappears, somebody else buys it, they could. Uh, we it's not as though they can just put anything on it. We still have zoning pro powers. It still has to meet our general plan. Um, so it's not going to be a, a, a chicken rendering plant uh, or an SBCA facility, either one. It won't be one of those. Um, but that still leaves a lot of range. And when we were having the debate about what this project should be, we got a lot of feedback. When Cordish went out in the community and said, how about this map? And some people said, that's too many houses, or that's too many apartments, or that's too many boat slips. Whatever. We're very opinionated as a community, but that's, we get, that's what we get. You know, we get to choose our, our own future. So we're trying to avoid um, this falling into the wrong hands. And, and being used for purposes that don't advance West Sacramento's interests. So that's, that's, that's the reason we're here tonight. At the same time, we have an obligation to make sure that we are uh, conducting um, the business of the agency and the public in a way that's, one, going to achieve a better goal. than what We know that what the governor's proposed is horrible compared to what, we were do what we're doing today, the deliberative process of engaging communi the community in what the future should look like. But we also need to make sure we're not, we, don't, we don't do harm in our responses. And so part of our, the, the, the choices that we've got to make you know, tonight are around what that right balance is. We, we're not interested in simply going around unloading all of the properties today just so that we do. We, we don't want to do the damage that that, that that other agency might do. And we can't, as a fiduciary matter, uh, just give away everybody's piece of property. But to me, at least, and I, and, and I think it's true for the whole council, our, interest is in, our primary interest is in making sure that that community asset becomes the best thing that it can be for the community. And that's our, our, our moral, our oath of office obligation to make sure that that occurs. So whatever we choose, that's, that, that I think is the point. So, so sort of moving down from the 30,000 foot level to this, to the document, I think the fundamental challenge for, for me at least is it doesn't, it doesn't assure that, right? We have to, because all, all the document does is say, here is the property we know what you would like to do with it, and we think that's great. That's what we want to do too. But we can't control. Uh, we can't control that, except in the most broad terms, right? That you know that that uh, if Cordish wants to do something other than what uh, you know, other than in very general terms we've already discussed, then it's actually not even that they can't do it. But before they do that, they have to give us the option or somebody the option because we don't know if we would exist as the redevelopment agency, but. They would give us or this new agency the option to buy the property back. 
um, but most likely at a higher rate, right? Uh, you know, almost certainly. I mean, the, the market right now, if the market was worse than it is today, then there wouldn't be any development project proposed anyway. So the only, only circumstance under which we would be repurchasing the property would be if there was a market to build. And if there's a market to build, then it will be worth more than it is today. So we would be selling the property to Cordish today for this price, based on today's property values. At that moment, we would either have to decide, will we pay a lot more for it back, or are we okay with them building something other than what uh, we have envisioned all along through this process? And that's not their intention, it's not our intention, but we can't, un un under any of these documents, assure that we or they are gonna be the specific people making these choices, because some of these choices could be in 20, 20 years from now, based on the way that the, the option extensions work with the, with the parcelization. And, and uh, so I, to me, I, I'm just not convinced that this framework achieves what we really want, which is to make sure that we're able to guarantee that what's get, what's get built, what gets built there is, is, uh, what is it fits with what the community's interests are. And the broad bush doesn't do it, right? It's important, but it, I think we learned from that whole conversation that we had in the community outreach in the last three years that it's just not enough to say, a you know high energy mixed use district or whatever you know whatever our term, that's not enough that, that that has a lot of different <laughs> there's a lot of openings into into what that can mean and a lot of reasonable disagreements about what Cordish might think and what we might think but under this arrangement we wouldn't have any say basically over how that how that might play out and, and I don't think that we can uh, I'm concerned that we that that's that we can't really justify that so to me that's the that's the number one issue here is that we don't have uh, there's not the, essentially the equivalent of well, there's not, I mean, there, as the agency, we're not requiring that there be any development agreement between uh, the property owner and um, the city. And uh, that seems inconsistent with, for a project of this scale, 200 plus acres in a prime location, uh, a defining project for the community that the city uh, wouldn't have a development agreement like, like we do with, with, you know, virtually every other important project that's in our city limits. So, to lead off. Mayor Pro I mean, sorry, Mayor Pro Christoph, I was looking at you okay. and I'm talking to you. Yeah, um, as far as just comments, um, I mean, I think you're, you're, you're pretty right on, Mr. Mayor. I mean, it's from um, some of the things that, that I've, notes that I've written down that I wanted to speak to tonight. And I do think that this area really d does need to be master plan. Uh, we need community involvement as well as planning commission involvement, city council involvement. Because this is such a unique piece of property. Um, as I had said earlier, oh, a few months ago, or maybe a year ago, um, this particular piece of property is our rail yard. It is that important to us, or it should be that important to us. Now, the, re the possibility that the state will take away the redevelopment agency certainly puts um, this issue at the forefront. But this is such a unique piece of property. I do think that we need to take the time um, and uh, see if we can work some things out uh, with Cordish, because I do think that Cordish should continue to be the developer, but certainly not under the proposal that, that I've seen. Uh, I just don't think that's worthy of uh, West Sacramento because of so many other kinds of uh, uh, issues. We really do need to know and have some input on what is going to be built. Um, I have seen some of the renderings that um, they've done years ago, and they were nice, but all they were was housing projects. They were just pounding up houses. I mean, that's what the market was dictating. And the market was, was headed in that direction. People were making a ton of money. As I think everybody remembers they were making a ton of money just off pounding up houses. But this needs to be more than that. And so, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't know if there are other entities that uh, we can work with, um, but I mean, I do think that uh, um, this area should really become a destination point as far as West Sacramento is concerned. It is, it is that well situated. And so I'm looking at 
possibly trying to make some changes or see, you know, where the council wants to go on that. But, um, and uh, just see if we can, we can make this a, a, a better product. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vegas. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I'll follow with that. I, I would echo what I think both of you have already pretty eloquently articulated. And I, I guess for me, none of this, you know, it, it's, it's, it's difficult because none of this would be happening at, uh, without what I think the mayor indicated earlier, and that is, you know, the, the uh, proposal for the redevelopment um, elimination. And I think we're now moving very quickly, unfortunately, and we're trying to salvage what I think, Bill, you alluded to as kind of a prime piece of property in our community. And that's, it's very difficult to digest all of this very quickly, um, knowing that we had intentions early on when we seeked out the support of Cordish to help develop the property that we were going to get a quality product and that this was our, our, our one opportunity to develop waterfront uh, as, we, as we know it. Um, and it's, it's a bit of a, I say a fire sale, but it's, it's, it's complicated in that we don't know if we're doing more harm than good by entering into what is a pretty sweet deal for the developer, um, not knowing what state legislation might do to undo this project or gloss over it or uh, completely unravel it and make things even worse for us down the road. So I think for me, one of the things that I'd like to see, um, and I think Bill, you alluded to it, is finding a way to, um, and I'll go back to what I think the, the you know, the, Mr. Tellis indicated earlier, and that is, I mean, they're a world-class operation. They're committed to a world-class uh, project, but I think our responsibility, the five of us, our responsibility is to not only make sure that we have, you know, the intentions of all parties um, today interested in developing a world-class product, but that we have you know, sort of the legalese in place for future councils and other folks, the Planning Commission, uh, members of the public, to uh, rest assured that we're going to get a world-class product or project. And, um, and again, this is a complicated issue that has sort of landed in our lap given what's happened in the last 90 days with the state budget, but I think it's our absolute responsibility to make sure that we are getting the best uh, possible product and that we're um, putting in place the language that ensures that we get that best product. And so I don't know what the, what the best process is to make it happen, but I certainly know that what we have here this evening um, doesn't give us that, that, that ultimate authority to make some of the, the land use decisions that I think we're going to want. Um, in light of uh, its proximity to the river. So I, I would support, and I know that others are going to speak on it, but I would support something a little more specific about um, what it is we get to say, how much we have to say, and what this product looks like as, as we go uh, uh, into the future with the development. Ledesma? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, I'll, I'll echo um, a, a few of your your comments as well as the other council members and um, you know and just in working in this in the past through the Planning Commission and seeing how important that process is um, to the public as a, as a way to um, as the assurance of vetting projects um, as they went through on behalf of the community I think it, it has um, solidified for me the need to make sure that and especially on a property like this I think we all have um, and from the developer and, and the council have all talked about this, how important this project is and this property is to West Sacramento. And I don't think there's any dispute about our, our, um, our, our thought on that. But that one principle for me was, it was, in, was around ensuring that our community um, had, had some control or at least some input and assured of the input into what happens, what's happened here. Mr. Vegas is absolutely right, as it was the mayor and Mr. Kristoff, in terms of um, what's what's forced this conversation and, and to come so quickly has been um, circumstances outside of our control. Um, and that is what the governor has proposed and whether or not whether or not that will uh, that vote will take place uh, tomorrow or the next week or the next three months, we don't know. Um, but what we what I know, at least the principle that I'm s sitting on is 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 around the need for us to, to make decisions today, and this is something we, at least I tried to do in prior years at the Planning Commission, was make decisions today as we would as we would in good times. And I think we have to 
as hard as it is to not know, not know outcomes and not know where, where things, where things may land. Um, I, I think the scene where we are so to date on this, on what's been negotiated and what's come up, um, that we're still falling short of, of some basic principles that we started off with. And I'd like to see that um, looked at again and, and addressed again, um, as everyone's intimated so far. Um, I think it is important that we have built into any deal we make um, the ability of this community to have some um, um, say and some uh, input into this process and whatever agreement we need to do that, the you know, agreement we need to effectuate to make it, make it happen, um, I'm supportive of. Um, I, I think the only other, um, uh, you know, and maybe we need to take a step back, um, you know, and, and, and you know, we've run up so quickly and so fast to this point. Um, just taking this moment to step back and see where we are will, will allow us to maybe look at some new, uh, new approaches to this. I think the, the mayor brought up that the, the, the current framework doesn't work. Well, then we need to find a new framework that does. And if that means looking at other options or, or what does the, the, the worst case or the, the, the subsequent actions of the governor's proposal look like and then we will but the, the most important for, part for for me uh, is is making sure that that core principle that our city has that option has that ability to control that is, is still something that we need that needs to be addressed so um, that's my comments thank you Mr. Henderson. thanks um, yeah the um, you know I'm, I'm kind of approaching this that um, we've had a lot of discussions with Cordish over the years and um, and Cordish has been a good partner. They've um, shown that they've um, developed good projects. Um, I've had the opportunity to view their, their Baltimore Harbor, which uh, they completely uh, renovated and rehabilitated um, into a really vibrant area of that part of the country. And I understand the projects, projects that they've um, um, done elsewhere in the company. And it's, the company does have a history of um, outstanding projects. but. Um, but part of the problem is this, the way the agreement's drafted now, that it may not be quarters that's going to be ultimately dealing with the property. And for me, that's that's a, a huge unknown, because if it was quarters through the entire thing, it's one thing, but, but we've got an issue of, of whether or not they're going to be there. And, and I kind of uh, well, I, um, would reiterate what the other council have said in terms of uh, the city really needs to be able to control some kind of destiny um, on this property, um, uh, and that could either be, um, uh, since we really don't have the ability to um, control whether the, court, the assignment or not. But you know, part of the problem that we have is, is as uh, my um, fellow council members have, have discussed, is we're kind of in a tight position now, and, and we don't want to be in a position of, of throwing away city property, uh, because really what this this um, uh, the deal looks like. And, and the deal itself is not that bad. It basically holds the value of this property for over 20 years at today's value. Now, the redevelopment agency can provide preferential value to projects, and that's one of the reasons, that, one of the ways it spurs development. So, um, you know, we've done that before. We've actually uh, been able to donate property to projects to help uh, the financing package actually get something that we want. But, but we wouldn't do that unless it's a project that we want. So that's really kind of the critical thing. And I know it seems like we're all on the same page that it's, it's really a, a prime piece of property. We have to be able to control it in some way. Um, and I sure hope that we can um, bring Cordish along for that. I think you're the right partner. I'm Mayor Parton Christoph. Just one last comment. I think it sort of sets a tone in some respects. And that is the one question that I ask myself and that is, if the state was not in the mood to take away a redevelopment agency, would we cut this deal? Without a doubt, we would not even, I mean, we wouldn't look at it a second time. And so that tells me that, you know, that there's some work to do. And, you know, I, I think that we should maybe come back very soon after the city, the agency, and Cordish have an opportunity to hear what our discussions were and, you know, maybe bring something back uh, early.
probably next week, like Tuesday or something like that. And because I do think that there's room for an, uh, improvement. And so, you know, that's something that I would uh, at least ask the council to take a look at as uh, uh, we have further deliberations on this particular issue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Christoph. Thank you, Mr. Christoph. Can you say something, Mr. Viegas? Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I think, you, Bill, you're on to something, because I know the state is moving very quickly with their legislation, and I think if we're going to do something, I mean, there, there is a, an element of urgency, and if we, if there's agreement to be had, I would rather know that sooner than later, because I think we do more harm by yeah. our indecisiveness or not making a decision. Um, so I would support having, and I don't know what the specific language is, whether that means um, entering into a development agreement, which I know is what we all intended to have. I, certain, I certainly did. I, I certainly sort of fell in love with that opportunity as an agency to utilize th that tool mm -hmm. to ensure that we get what we want. I mean, no, no disrespect to, the, to Cordes, because I know they have the intentions as well, um, but I think it's critical that, I said, as I said before, that although we may not be ultimately here or here when elements of the deal are struck, there needs to be those assurances that the community is going to get the best product. And it's evident tonight by the testimony by, you know, folks from Wallace and Cool and Miyamoto and River City Rowing that this developer is interested in doing quality work because you don't just bring those folks along. But I also think there is an interest, an element of time sensitivity that needs to be um, considered as well. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, to me, there's, I mean, we have, there's a couple of, of options and I'd rank them one way now. I might rank them a different way five days from now. Depend. I mean, it's just we are living in a in, in an extraordinary moment in the way that it, that the legislature has a uh, you know the potential meat acts at our necks, um, and it changes everything. So, um, uh, I mean, the ideal solution, I, I guess, in, in in one way would be to have an agreement today. Right. The ideal solution would be for the legislature to wake up and say, "This is the most ridiculous <laughs> thing we've ever. We can't. We can't believe that we are forcing communities like West Sacramento to have to sell a park because that's what the you know folks who think this is Stone Stone Lock. If you don't know what that means, if you don't use Honda Hills, it's this. It's also the the recreation area, the Barge Canal recreation access. So uh, ideal, ideally, the legislature said, "Oh, how could we have been so wrong?" And um, that's that's ideal. Uh, that's number one. But if you, if you couldn't accomplish that, and, and this could happen, I guess, in the legislature, it could happen tomorrow, it could happen in two weeks, uh, it could happen never. And, uh, and so th there's a temporal uh, nature to this, to this issue, which to me suggests it's not just about going up and spending another you know, week or two negotiating. And so I, I agree with the need to, to, move, to move quickly. Um, I mean, I, I, to me, what, 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 this, what we need, I mean, the fundamental way, that, the only way that this option, an option agreement could work is if it had a requirement that there be a, a development agreement with the city. Um, that's a big change from what's in front of us if you're the developer. So I don't want to, and we don't do these kinds of things in, at the day. So I, 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 we're not going to sit here and try to do, uh, negotiate a, a document here. Um, but it, and if, we had, uh, uh, if we had an option agreement that included that requirement, and there might be a couple of other nits here and there, but I mean that's the fundamental. If we had that, um, you know, I'd be comfortable with moving forward with that immediately, and that would be to everybody's benefit. You know, if if we if we pass that tonight and tomorrow, Cordish said, oh, that's exactly what we were hoping for. We just never mentioned it that way, <laughs> and we signed it in the morning, and we were able to isolate the project from um, the from the grasp of the of the legislature and the governor. That's that's the ideal solution. Um, Obviously, we don't know that Cordish would agree, and, and, I, and I think my, you know there's a good good likelihood that they might not. To me, uh, the next best option is is to think about you know the potential. I mean, there is another governmental agency in our community that could uh, you know could hold this property, um, maybe not 100% securely, given the way that the redevelopment lo uh, legislation is being written, but that could. And and so I, I think you know what, that we ought to be exploring conversations with the port district. Around the port being uh, the uh, having the, the option or the ownership directly of the property, and, and so I guess w one way, you know, sort of the um, ag aggressive legislature for a call for aggressive tactics, but maybe one way to approach it is to is to uh, is to you know grant approval of an option agreement that includes the the the, the development agreement with the city requirements. Um, authorize its its signature. If the signature comes, then great, and we move forward. 
but that we concurrently call on, on the assumption that it might not that we concurrently call call a special meeting of this of, of the redevelopment agency board for um, the early part of next week and and, and ask uh, chairman McGowan if he would be willing to convene a meeting of the port commission and, and have this, the, uh, a parallel discussion I, mean, I know that's a that's a bit aggressive given but I uh, given that the acts could fall tomorrow it could fall Monday it could fall Tuesday or it might not fall at all and I think we, you know we also have to be prepared that we don't want to rush in I mean I think all the council this is what the council has been saying as well we don't want to rush into a, a bunch of decisions that may not be in the community's best interest um, and then have the whole thing not happen and we will will have significant regrets around uh, around the choices that we make so that's that's I, I put that option out there as one alternative Well, it, 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 it's sort of occurs to me that's probably a, all of the above that we've got to take all the tracks. I mean, we we um, all um, stated our desires within this agreement, and obviously, given you know uh, quarters the opportunity to respond not tonight certainly, but they need an opportunity to to go back and. You know, I think we've all articulated the need to, to address certain core principles that we're, 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 we're um, that we have around this. But I think you're right. We, it would be prudent for us to also concurrently look at these other um, mechanisms. So I, I think it's. Are you just asking? That's the tact you want to take. I mean, I'd, I'd be supportive because it has to be all of the above, and certainly um, we're we're going to have to get back and staff continue to work with Cordish to try to reach some resolution. Because um, if we can, that would be the, the, the first thing, to all the work that's been done. Um, that would be the first thing. That would probably be the, the low-hanging fruit if we can get there. And hopefully we can. I would, be. I, I, I would be supportive of, you know, if you want to put together uh, something like that um, this evening. And, I mean, I, I certainly think court is probably uh, going to have to talk to their partners and owners and all the other kinds of things, but I mean, I, I do think that uh, um, we can put something together like a development agreement, and and maybe there could be some language also that talks about making sure it's Cordish that does the development and they're not selling off uh, chunks of it to somebody else. Um, then you know, it's something that uh, um, I'd be I'd be supportive of, and then like you say, uh, get a meeting of the. Port Commission and a meeting of the City Council by, we'll say next Tuesday. Um, at least we're making an effort to try to move this thing along as quickly as we possibly can. And you know, if there's a meeting that needs to be done Friday, uh, I'm more than willing to. Uh, um, this is such an important piece that I'm more than willing to make every effort to do whatever I can. Yeah, I would just, I would concur that we probably need to have the options moving forward. And, um, we, we don't want to be in a position where we're restricted to plan A and with no plan B or plan C. So I think um, that would at least uh, give us an option to, to move forward in the most prudent way for the uh, public. Uh, uh, Ms. Richardson? Yes, M Mr. Mayor, I think the, the council's direction is clear, but I wanted just to make sure that we had it correctly is that um, we would be exercising the option on the condition that there was an approved development agreement between the developer and the city, and that would be under the same terms and conditions that we would do that we do all development agreements. Is that, is that an accurate depiction? I think a lot of the other issue, other issues that we have, right. would be covered in the development in the agreement development. that we have. Right. We would have. Right. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, that was that was my understanding. <coughs> My suggestion well, I, I think that it probably needs to go in maybe a little stranger phase than what we're normally used to. <coughs> and that is, oh, we can't do a development agreement in, in three days. I mean, it's going to take some time. Um, even the, our city attorney is saying, no, I need some time. But, um, he's usually so speedy. <laughs> I know, he's very fast. But <laughs> I, So I think that this option component of it, it's something that can work very expeditiously but I, I at the same time I think then that that also needs to include that that language that you talked about as far as development agreement just so we can 
make sure we can make these different milestones. Right. 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 We can't actually do a development agreement at the moment. One, we don't. I mean, that's there's a lot to that, and a lot of negotiations. But two, we, that requires a full-scale environmental review, and so that those that we have. The, we can't do a development agreement or put a development agreement concurrent with the option agreement, but requiring that there be one is a different matter. Mr. Viegas? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. But I would want to emphasize once once again that part of this has to happen, and again, this isn't by our choice, but part of this has to happen pretty quickly, right? I mean, I think we, we need to get some indication, I don't want to say yesterday, but almost yesterday, as to whether or not this is even an item for further discussion, right? I mean, I think a lot of the components or the principles of the development agreement have been worked on, not specifically or certainly not completely fleshed out, but there have been discussions for three years, right? We've been having conversations about concepts and ideas and themes and different things. It would seem to me that if we're not tracking along those lines, there might not be a conversation to have beyond tomorrow. But if there is an interest expressed by, by everybody um, that that is still an interest, then I think it warrants further conversation. But otherwise, we need to move on to plan C or D, and whatever that is probably needs to come before us for further conversations um, Tuesday or whatever day we decide, because again, this, this issue with this legislature is not going away, and they're going to continue to hammer until they get the final vote, and they'll vote at 3 in the morning if need be. So I think we need to think of it in those terms. Right, I think that's right. I mean, just having the, an agreement signed without an expectation that we're actually going to do a development agreement is not in anybody's on a course's interest to, to, to swirl around waste time. It's certainly not an hour because during that time, uh, you know, then the property would revert to this successor agency, which is, you know, not our optimal. It's not the end of the world, but it's definitely not our optimal outcome. Does the council want to provide any direction about the, about a timeline to get a development agreement adopted? That would be a, a condition of the option. Are you recommending? I th so I thought what you had said that at, in order to exercise the option, there would have to be a development agreement in that option? Right, that's, that's what we're talking about. Right now, if you just stuck a requirement that it be a condition of exercise, then the term, the initial term of the option is still seven years. So theoretically, it could take up to seven years to get a development agreement. If that's okay, then, then we would go in that direction. But if you were looking to have sort of a go, no-go point, the option, you know, the development agreement needed to be approved within two years or, I don't know, some, some date. I, mean, I would love to do that. My only concern with that is, uh, I mean, uh, you know, rushing a development agreement through when we don't have, I mean, although we've had very encouraging news from FEMA about mapping in the last week, to not, we, we don't have certainty about that. And the, and the market conditions, you know, obviously, to, I, I mean, I, I would want to be careful to not uh, back a developer into a corner to say, right now in the worst market ever, right. tell us exactly what you're going to build. Okay. So I don't, I don't know that a rushed development agreement, I mean, although I'd like to have it. Okay. I'm not sure that that's in any, but it's in their interest or ours to say, you know, you got, you got eight minutes to produce a development agreement. <laughs> Mr. Johannesson? Yeah, yeah, I think the, probably the other factor in this particular area is the uh, streetcar, whether or not we go north and south, and over the next, how long that's going to take, and that would directly impact the development agreement on the type of development if there's an accessible streetcar line going down there. So, and that's not going to happen in the next couple of years. All right, so then, uh, 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 and correct, so then correct me if I'm wrong, with, uh, Madam City Manager and Mr. City Chair, then the motion would be to uh, adopt the resolution approving the agreement, authorize the Chair and Executive Director to execute, but with, the, with, that, with that central modification and other conforming uh, right. changes. Right. Um, I feel like the most critical one being provided that the option includes a provision requiring there to be an executed development agreement between the developer and the city prior to the exercise, first exercise of the option. Okay, and then the, the uh, I think we'd like you to continue the meeting until if Tuesday's your designated date. Okay, so okay. all right, okay. so that would, that would be a two-part motion to that okay. effect? Yeah. And move by Mayor Pro well, I would, Yeah, I would, uh, I, I would move the execution of option agreement uh, mm -hmm. with the different caveats that we've talked about and at the same time continue this meeting until uh, Tuesday, um, we'll do a lunch meeting, mm -hmm. uh, Evening? Okay, so uh, uh, 7 o'clock or 6 o'clock Tuesday. Yeah, I could do I could do three or four. Bill, you should not be coming. You got all Retired people should. should not be running our meeting <laughs> schedule. <laughs> Pick a time, gentlemen. Okay. Can we say so? We're going to need a closed session, so can we do six? Okay. 
All right, so that's the motion. Is there a second? Okay, so it's been seconded by Mr. Johansson. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Um, as we move forward, I just, I, you know, this is a difficult conversation, and it's complex, and, and you know, since we're in the, in the heat of, an, of a negotiated item, which may or may not work for a lot of different reasons, being forced in that position, I don't want there to be any confusion. We are, because I know I speak for the council, we're very free, uh, we remain excited about the project, and Cordish is a, has been a great partner, and we hope to be able to make this work. This, uh, and Cordish didn't have to come forward at this stage and say, we're willing to, we understand you have this challenge on redevelopment, can we make something work? And so they've made a good faith effort, and I know our staff worked hard on this as well. So I don't want to in any way diminish that. There, this was not an attempt by courts to do anything, um, even if it might not have been the deal points exactly that we, that you know, the council was ready to embrace all at once. Um, Cordish has done, you know, stepped up to try to find a, find a solution with our staff, and uh, we hope that that will continue. But regardless, I, I want to I express our, our gratitude to Cordish for both their long-term partnership and for their work to try to try to come up with something that would deal with the craziness in the Capitol. All right, Council Calendar, Ms. Richardson. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to remind the Council that next next Wednesday we have the Public Safety um, Awards across the street at the Community Center. And now we have a special meeting on the 23rd and then the 29th. Okay, uh, any questions on the calendar? City Manager report, Ms. Richardson. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, members of the Council, I just wanted to um, alert you and the public that with all the rains, we have been actively um, involved in trying to um, keep a watch on our levees where uh, our management, our uh, um, EOC management team has been meeting um, daily um, to review the situation and uh, Ken Rusich of RV900 has been um, coordinating 24-hour levee patrols and um, they haven't detected any issues or problems with um, the, the levees. There is another storm that's going to be coming in tonight and we think we're well poised to monitor the conditions and we've been keeping the public informed on our website and on our city highlights and um, so I think um, I think we have the situation under, under control but we'll keep you posted if anything changes. Any questions for the acting city manager? Our city attorney report. Nothing to report. Staff direction from members of the council. We have no future agenda item requests. So a motion to adjourn. Move. So we move by Mayor Pro Tem Kristen, seconded by Mr. Villegas. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you.